In this lesson, we're going to take a look at some of the basics of data and statistics. Statistics is simply the study of data. Data is nothing more than information. We have two types of data. We have qualitative data, which deals with descriptions, things that you can observe, but you can't really measure on a numerical scale. For example, color, texture, smell, taste, appearance, zip codes, so on and so forth. Anything that describes something is called qualitative data. It deals with the qualities. Quantitative data, on the other hand, is numerical data. It's things that can be measured on a scale, and it deals with exact numbers. For example, the length of a board, the height of people, the area of a building, the volume of a sphere, weight, speed, time, and so on and so forth. Anything that can be measured with an exact quantity is quantitative data. Here we have a couple of examples on example two. There were 735 plants on display at the gardening expo. Notice that 735 is an exact quantity. 735, therefore, is quantitative data. There were 27 more plants on display this year than last year. 27 more might be a number, but it does not give us an exact quantity. It simply describes the number of plants compared to last year. Therefore, this is an example of qualitative data. Examples C, D, and E are for you to try. Please pause the video here and determine whether each statement represents qualitative or quantitative data. Part C, there were scores of plants on display at the expo. We know that one score is 20, but we don't know how many scores of plants there were. We just have a description. This is qualitative data. In a survey, 52 people said that their preferred presidential candidate is Barack Obama. 52 is an exact quantity, and therefore, we have quantitative data. Finally, in a survey, people said that they spend between five and six hours each week following presidential elections. Because we only have a description of the amount of time between five and six, and not an exact quantity, we have qualitative data. There are two types of data that we might collect, not only qualitative versus quantitative, but univariate versus bivariate. <clears throat> Suppose we make a list, a list of the computers in each classroom at Sutherland High School. Mr. Jones comes out, and here's the list he has. There's only one column on this list. That's univariate data. There's one variable. Suppose he decides to record not only the number of computers, but also the room number. Now, he has two columns, an X column and a Y column. This is bivariate data. So really, when it comes to comparing univariate and bivariate data, the only difference is the number of pieces of information we collect. If our table would have one column, meaning we collected one piece of information, it's called univariate, one variable. If our table, our list, would have two columns, it's called bivariate more than one, or in this case, two, variables. In examples three and four, we want to determine whether these are examples of univariate or bivariate data. In number three, we've recorded the number of computers in several different classrooms. That's univariate data because we've simply gone into each room and written down how many computers are in that room. In example four, we added a second column. We wrote the number and the age of the computers in the classrooms. Here we have two columns on our table, the number of computers and the age, and that's bivariate data. Example five and six are for you to try. This discusses the federal budget by year. The federal budget is the amount of money the government plans to spend. In example six, they talk about the deficit or the surplus. Deficit is the amount of money that we're short. We don't have that much money. We have to borrow it from somewhere in order to have it. Surplus means we have more money than we intend to spend. We have some left over. Take a look at example five and six. Pause the video here and give those a try. In example five, we have the amount of the federal budget. That's univariate data. We simply have a list that has the amount of money for each year. Example six, we have the budget as well as the amount of deficit or the amount of surplus. Here we have two columns, budget 
and deficit. That's bivariate data. When it comes to statistics, your information is really what drives your accuracy. How do we collect good information? We have a couple of options. We could ask everybody, a process known as taking a census, or we could ask some people and predict what everybody would say based on those answers. We call that taking a sample. So how do we know if we want to take a census or a sample? Well, suppose we want to start. So how do we know if we want to take a census or just select a sample? Well, it's actually very simple. It's important to keep in mind that a census, while accurate, is very expensive and takes a lot of time. A sample, while less accurate, you get much quicker results and it's much less expensive to conduct. Suppose you have a manufacturer who is going to print folders for the new school year, and this manufacturer wants to know what colors are popular. We could go out to every high school in the country and ask every student what their favorite color was for a folder. If we asked every person, we'd have very accurate information. We would know exactly what we wanted to produce. Unfortunately, it would take a lot of time to do that and it would cost us a lot of money. Instead, if we select students at, say, 500 high schools throughout the United States and we ask only those students, our results are less accurate, but we get them back much quicker and it's much less expensive to do. If we take our sample and we see, for instance, that blue is a popular color, we might make the assumption that blue is a popular color for high school students across the country. When we select a sample, we have to be very careful. There are several criteria that we must adhere to. First of all, the sample must fairly represent the entire population being studied. Suppose you're interested in an entire high school population. It's not sufficient to ask only ninth graders a question. You're going to want to ask all the classes, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. You must also collect a significant number of data values. It's not sufficient to ask only one person what their favorite color is it's probably better to ask 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people so that you have an understanding of what colors are liked in general. Finally, your sample should be random so that you don't have bias. Picking names out of a hat, for example, is random selection. Or asking every tenth person who enters the supermarket is another way that you can avoid bias. Your sample is completely random. You didn't specifically pick out people who you were going to ask. In example 7, Chelsea wants to survey the students in her school to find out what their favorite sports are. Which would be the best sample to use? In this case, we have four choices. Every 20th person entering the school building, all of the students who sit at the same table during lunch, all the members of the football team, and students in ninth grade homerooms. Which is the least biased, the best sample? Well, choice A. If we ask every 20th person, we're no longer selecting people who are on a specific sports team, who are in a single grade, or who sit together at lunch and might have similar preferences. How about example eight? Please pause the video here. In this example, we asking every 20th person selected randomly from a list of people in Pittsburgh would be the best way to find this information out. If we ask folks entering the Republican meeting, they're probably going to choose a Republican. And if we ask people from the list of Libertarians, they're probably going to choose a Libertarian. If we ask people who only make more than $100,000, well, in that case, we've left out anyone in our community who makes less than, less than that. Your results may be biased if you do not ask good questions. For example, if you ask a question, should children waste their time playing video games? You're suggesting that playing video games is a waste of time. That is a biased question. A better question would be, should children play video games, yes or no? Determine whether each of these questions is fair or biased. Who is your preferred presidential candidate? That's a fair question because people can put any candidate in who they would like. Example 9. Do you think that Rick Santorum would be a bad president? This is a biased question. It's suggesting that Rick Santorum would be a bad president. Number 10 and 11. 10. Do you think that Congress is doing a bad job? 
That's a biased question. It's suggesting that they're doing a bad job. A better way to ask that, how do you feel about the performance of the United States Congress? This suggests that it's neither good nor bad, but you're asking the person for their opinion. Graphs can be misleading. This is the last piece of our lesson for today. Statistics can be used to lie 100% honestly. In this example, if you look at the graph, it looks like Jenkins has twice as many votes as Harris. But look at how the graph was constructed. It turns out that Harris has 197 votes, Jenkins has 200. Really, Jenkins only has three more votes, even though his bar looks twice as high. That's because the x-axis, or rather the y-axis, was shrunk, and therefore we only got a piece of the graph. When you're looking at graphs, you have to be very careful. You have to look to make sure that you know what you're reading. Take a look at this graph here. This was a survey taken in December 2010 prior to the Iowa caucuses. The Iowa caucuses are where people come together to express who they would like to run for president. In this case, we have the Republican candidates, and it looks like, based on the graph, that Ron Paul and Mitt Romney are neck and neck. But if you look at the numbers on the right-hand side, this graph is misleading. It turns out that Ron Paul has 40% of the vote, Mitt Romney had almost 23% based on this poll. So this graph really doesn't show the true picture at all. It's very deceiving. By the way, who won the Iowa caucuses in 2010? It was essentially a tie between Michelle Bachman and Ron Paul. And this is everything you need to know to get started with data and statistics, some basic vocabulary, and some ideas of how you can collect data.